So let's start uh, the scientific session on Kelvin probe force microscopy with our three invited speakers uh, that we are very honored to have with us today. So we will start with uh, Stefan Weber, joining us from the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research in Mainz. Uh, Stefan, feel free to start your sh uh, share sh uh, screen sharing session anytime now. So Stefan is a, is a great microscopist who likes to push the technique to its limit. And uh, because he's the first speaker, he also promised to give a bit of a background for the KPFM technique and, and then introduce us to this imaging surface potential dynamics on perovskite solar cells. So without further ado, uh, please, Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So let me start my video. You can also see me. So uh, uh, thank you very much, Romain, um, and uh, the Zurich Instruments team for inviting me to this uh, to this user meeting and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, yeah, so uh, as I'm the first one, uh, I promise to give a little introduction into Kelvin Probe and to also um, yeah, bring us all on the same page on what are the uh, modern methods for doing Kelvin probe uh, right now. So uh, the uh, the basic principle of Kelvin probe. Now here we go, is that uh, we have a, a the tip and the surface. Now let me get my laser pointer. So the tip and the surface. Uh, if we have two metallic materials, uh, if we look at the energy band diagram, they will have different work functions. And as long as they are not connected, uh, the, the band diagram will look like this. But as soon as we establish an electrical connection between the tip and the surface, the uh, Fermi levels of the two materials will align. Uh, which will lead to um, uh, so electrons flowing from one side to the other. And if the tip and the surface are close to each other, which is the case during an AFM experiment, there will be surface charges both on the sample and on the surface. And if we have uh, two oppositely polarized uh, surfaces close to each other, there will of course be an electrostatic force between those two surfaces. And as we're doing force microscopy, we can very sensitively detect the force between the tip and the surface. So uh, what can we do to quantify this potential difference between um, those two materials? It's, it's quite straightforward. We just apply, we instead of just using a normal, uh, a, a simple connection, we use a voltage source to compensate this potential offset between the tip and the surface. And um, by the way, this, this potential difference between the tip and the surface, this is called the contact potential difference, which is the difference in the work functions. So, um, so we, we, the, the feedback works in a way that it tries to compensate this potential offset by, um, and, and uh, looks at the force between the tip and the surface. And as soon as the force is zero, uh, the, the feedback knows, okay, I'm now at the contact potential difference. Um, how is that done practically? So uh, we'll have to go through some physics. So basically the tip sample gap is, we can, we can think of it as a capacitor and uh, the energy in a capacitor uh, is given by the capacity and the, the voltage squared. And if we want to get from that energy, the force, we need to take the derivative with respect to the distance of the plates. So uh, of, uh, of the energy of the plate capacitor, which uh, gives us this equation. So uh, the voltage does not depend on the distance, but the capacitance uh, depends on the distance. So this capacity gradient is a, a very important factor that I will come back to uh, in a minute. So basically, if we apply now an external voltage additional to the contact potential, and here typically what we use is a DC voltage for compensating the, uh, po uh, the potential difference and an AC voltage at an um, electrical frequency, which we use to detect the force. So AC, de uh, AC detection, we can use a lock-in. Um, uh, like like the ones from uh, a famous company based in Switzerland to detect the um, the amplitude that results from this uh, AC voltage and uh, thereby sensitively detect the point where the electrostatic forces are are minimized and so we need to use this voltage we need to square it and that leads uh, so we have a square of a sine function which with a little bit of math uh, gives us three spectral components, a static term, 
which is often forgotten um, that it also exists because uh, especially when you have differences in the capacity gradient or if you use a strong a high AC voltage, these static forces can be quite high. And if the cantilever is quite soft, you can have static bending, which changes the tip sample distance and thereby also the capacity gradient. So this is something that uh, one should keep in mind. Then there is a two omega component, which is sensitive again to the capacity gradient. But the most important one that we want to look at right now is this um, the, the, the force component directly at the excitation frequency of the electrical um, excitation, which has this term here in the amplitude, which is the difference of the DC voltage and the contact potential difference. So if we, the compensating voltage is equal to the contact potential difference, this will become zero and this force component will vanish. And that's the basic principle of, um, of a Kelvin probe force microscope. So there is different, different uh, uh, ways to detect the potential difference now. So the most common one is the so-called amplitude modulation. Here we just simply look at the amplitude um, at this electrical excitation frequency. And so there, there's again different methods on how we can do that. So um, uh, the, 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 in, most, in most commercial systems, the standard method to use is the so-called lift mode or dual pass mode. And uh, this has the advantage. So basically the idea is that you scan the surface um, and measure the topography. Then you lift the tip up at a certain height above the surface. You follow the contour line again and do the electrical measurement. And the idea behind this is that at constant tip sample distance, you have a constant capacity gradient. Um, but this method, and in principle, that's right. In an ideal world, that, that should all work. But um, the, the disadvantage is that the tip is quite far away from the surface. And so uh, um, you also have long range uh, non-local interactions with a, with a cantilever, with a tip cone. Um, and also your, your closest, uh, the, the tip sample distance might not be the vertical distance, but especially on these curved surfaces, you might have um, a stronger interaction here at, uh, uh, at, a, at an angle with the surface. So uh, you might, and this makes the lift mode very prone to topography crosstalk. And um, as I will show later, it's also not ve very quantitative. Um, one way to uh, circumvent is go to single scan mode. Um, first of all, the advantage is it's faster, so you don't need to scan every scan line twice. You're closer to the surface, so it's more sensitive, but you don't get rid of every every uh, thing that is um, topographic crosstalk. And the reason is that the capacity gradient is still has very strong contributions from these surfaces that are far away from the surface, just because the cantilever, the surface area is much higher than the surface area of the tip. So, um, uh, a different a different approach is uh, frequency modulation KPFM, and here the, the basic idea, very briefly, is that um, the tip sample interaction, um, if it's not a constant force, but if it's a force that changes with respect to the distance, it will have a force gradient. And any force gradient, if you look at the dimensions of a force gradient, that's Newton per meter. Newton per meter is like a spring constant. So the effective spring constant that the cantilever um, has is changing and that leads to a detuning of the cantilever. So the resonance frequency will change. And uh, so the, what the, the, the most strict definition of frequency modulation would be that your use, the, the true frequency modulation KPFM would be that you're tracking the resonance frequency with a phase locked loop. That's uh, what's usually done in ultra high vacuum where you anyway need to track the resonance frequency because of the high Q factors of the cantilevers. Um, but this will not be what I'm talking about today because I'm also not an expert here. Um, the second way you can do um, FM KPFM is the so-called sideband FM KPFM. And the idea behind this uh, is that you do frequency mixing between the mechanical oscillation frequency of the cantilever, so your tapping mode or uh, whatever mode you're using, 
to to image the surface and the electrical uh, and the the, the uh, electrical force as a result of the um, electrical excitation that you apply. So the basic idea behind this is that as you're oscillating the tip um, close to the surface, you have a time dependent capacity gradient. And if we just look at a very simple model that we say, okay, our tip is crudely approximated by a plate capacitor as in the drawing that you've, um, um, the, quick drawing I made last night of a tip sample system. So if we crudely approximate this by a plate capacitor, the capacity is um, given by the dielectric constants, the surface area of the plate and the uh, divided by the distance. And uh, so in this case, we, we let this oscillate uh, with an amplitude of 25 nanometers close to the surface. And if we calculate the capacity gradient we see that this has this periodic shape. So this uh, this is now calculated for a 10 by 10 nanometer uh, plate capacitor. Uh, so you can see that whenever the tip gets close to the surface, not quite surprisingly, if you look at the equation, there will be a spike in the capacity gradient. So this is far from being constant. So in amplitude modulation, um, the, the, the relevant capacity gradient is basically the average value of this capacity gradient. Whereas in, um, <clears throat> for, for frequency modulation for the sideband FM KPFM, we assume that we now again a crude approximation, but that we approximate this with a sine function um, that, that has the same periodicity as the um, as this spikes in the capacity gradient. And yeah, so we can make a very rough estimation uh, how strong the capacity gradient will change. So we take the derivative of the capacity gradient, which is the second gradient of the capacity uh, and multiply this with the mechanical amplitude uh, times uh, the, the mechanical oscillation frequency. So this is our uh, approximation of the time dependent capacity gradient. And so we have, um, <clears throat> we have our approximation for the uh, capacity gradient and we just plug that into the um, force, uh, into this force component here. So we have a, a sine omega m times a sine omega e. So we have to multiply two sine functions. So you look it up uh, either in uh, the web sources or um, uh, in the, the good old uh, books where you have the, uh, the, uh, the theory for, for calculating trigonometric functions. And you do some math and you end up with um, an equation that has a force term that looks like this. So again, we have here the DC voltage minus the contact potential, which brings this whole force to zero when we compensate the contact potential. But now we have force components at frequencies uh, that are uh, around the mechanical resonance frequency. So if we excite, for example, here, this is the traditional way of doing sideband KPFM. We use a low frequency electrical excitation, which leads to these sidebands around um, Mechanical frequency, which is ideally at the resonance of the um, of the cantilever, and the two omega uh, component, of course, also gives sidebands. But the interesting ones are these omega m plus minus omega e sidebands. So, um, and then there is also recently uh, recent development, and um, is the so-called heterodyne FM KPFM, and here the idea is that we put the sideband frequency on the second eigenmode of the cantilever on the second resonance. So we have a signal enhancement of the, of the sideband signal, um, which, which of course gives us a higher signal to noise, but it also has a different advantage. So here, if we, for example, use a one kilohertz drive and uh, a 70 kilohertz uh, uh, resonance frequency cantilever, these sidebands Will, uh, will already be uh, quite far out of the resonance. So uh, there will be less resonance enhancement. Plus those frequency are really close together. So you need to really use a very small bandwidth to, uh, to avoid any signal leakage from this strong mechanical signal into these weak uh, 
uh, electrical signals. So this limits your bandwidth, whereas in this case, the mechanical frequency is far away. So you can use much higher bandwidths and thereby do faster measurements. So uh, my PhD student, Amelie, who's now working for um, Asylum or Oxford Instruments, uh, she did during her PhD, she did a really nice study of comparing all these different um, different modes that I've introduced to you so far. So the AM lift mode, um, the, um, the single frequency uh, uh, amplitude modulation, KPFM, in one case on the resonance enhanced on the second eigen mode and in one case off resonance, so below the first resonance, <clears throat> then the FM sideband and the FM heterodyne. And what she did is she compared the measured, uh, the measured potential uh, to a, a, so she had an electrode array applied an external voltage. So we have an expect an expected uh, voltage difference on the surface. And so she, me uh, she measured the, the voltage signal, the voltage difference detected through the AFM and compared the measured signal to the applied signal. And what's shown here is the deviation from the applied potential and uh, for, for the different methods. And this tiny graph here shows you how much of the externally applied signal those methods could detect. So the FM methods could detect um, more than 95% uh, accurately the externally applied potential, uh, closely followed by the single scan um, uh, second eigen mode um, detection and very far off is the AM lift mode, which is not at all quantitative. So we have a, a really huge difference here. And those millivolt um, values here are the offset here at zero. So here every, every method is quite similar. So the take home message is, so if you want to really have a quantitative measurement of the surface potential, FM and heterodyne KPFM are best. If you need to stick to an amplitude modulation mode, then use the resonance enhanced um, amplitude modulation mode. And uh, that's, that's the best you can use. So just to sum that up, uh, if you understood nothing so far, um, in a nutshell, Kelvin probe force microscopy, if you have a metal tip and a metal surface with different uh, uh, work functions, your KPFM system is able to quantify the difference in the work functions, the contact potential difference. And if you use um, active materials, if you apply an external voltage, or if you, for example, use a solar cell material and you uh, shine light on it, what you will detect is the contact potential plus any photo voltage or external voltage that you apply. So um, <clears throat> in a nutshell, Kelvin probe force microscopy is like a nanoscale voltage meter. So um, with that all established, I want to come to my main topic, which is the uh, methyl, uh, which is uh, perovskite solar cells. So here you see how we prepare um, a perovskite solar cell that's just an inkjet printer that prints a precursor solution onto a, a glass substrate. And as the solvent evaporates, you can see that this, um, that this material crystallizes and you have um, the perfect, uh, a perfect um, solar cell so, uh, thin film uh, prepared. So this is quite exciting. So these, these uh, materials have lots of advantages how, uh, and they are almost ideal uh, solar cell materials. Uh, so, uh, and giving high efficiencies and everything. So the, why, why is there still need for basic research and why do we need to use our um, expensive Kelvin probe equipment on these materials? So one reason why they are not on the market yet is, which, which I also can't solve uh, myself, is that these materials still contain lead. So <clears throat> it's not a lot, an awful lot of lead, uh, but there is lead in the structure and this is of course poisonous, but, uh, Something where, where, where we as a basic science or as, as microscopists can con contribute is to the uh, more thorough understanding of the material physics and the chemistry. So there's 
those uh, solar cells are still not 100% stable. And in the material, we have strong hysteresis and ion migration effects, which will I will explain in more detail in a minute. And it's still unclear what exactly is happening at interfaces. <clears throat> So what do I mean with hysteresis and ion migration? So if you record a current voltage curve on a perovskite solar cell, there will be different um, current density measured um, if you scan your voltage upwards compared to the downward scan. And usually taking such a, a current voltage scan on a device level uh, is um, takes a second to a minute. Here in this case, it took 20 seconds. And so that indicates that we have slow processes that are happening in the solar cell on a time scale of milliseconds to seconds. So what, what could be the reason for that? So in, an, in a solar cell, we have our active material sandwiched between, uh, between two electrodes. And the difference in the work functions that is now exactly the same as the energy diagram that I showed you in the beginning between um, the tip and the surface. Uh, this leads to a so-called built-in field. Now, um, this will probably never happen in a, in, a, in a solar cell because we usually have mobile charges that can be impurities, that can be uh, defects. In the case of perovskites, uh, you have a, 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 a relatively large mobility of the ionic species in your material. And this can lead to a screening of the built-in field. And if we now um, quickly change the, the internal potential landscape, for example, by applying an external voltage, these, this internal charge distribution say, takes a certain time to rearrange. And this, this delayed response uh, can cause a, an electric field in the cell, a transient electric field. And now depending on the polarity of this electric field, uh, this might be good or bad for the charge extraction. So, the, and this basically is the idea that explains um, why we see a different, uh, a different current output of the cell depending on whether we're scanning the voltage upwards or downwards. So that was the theory that was out there um, a couple of years ago, and uh, we were asking ourselves. What, what, uh, so we were asking, okay, can we actually visualize with, a, with, with scanning probe microscopy the reasons for this, um, uh, the, the, the microscopic reasons for hysteresis in these cells? So basically the ideas that were out there back then were um, either ion drift or ferroelectricity. So if you hear hysteresis, the first thing that came to my mind was, yeah, it could be ferroelectric. Um, this is something that my PhD student Ilka who is now working for Park Instruments. Um, and uh, she investigated that very thoroughly. And uh, she actually discovered uh, these striped domains in perovskite surfaces, which were quite um, exciting because nobody has reported them before. So actually the paper was the first one to report this, uh, these striped domains, which turned out to be actually ferroelastic twin domains. And so far, we couldn't find any signs of ferroelectricity in this material. So uh, from here on, I could also give a, a complete um, 45 minutes talk about uh, her PFM studies and uh, how we also used the DART mode to find out uh, about how the, uh, the, the domain walls in these materials affect the charge carrier transport. Um, but uh, I decided that I present the study on the ion migration. So I have to recommend you to read these awesome articles. And if you don't, if you're too lazy to read, go to my website. Uh, there's an audio version of this second paper, which you can just uh, listen to. Um, but yeah, the, the most important message here is that we found no signs of ferroelectricity. So that means that the, uh, the ion drift is the most likely um, cause for the hysteresis in these cells. And the idea being that, as I said before, that these mobile ions screen the electric field 
and that the delayed response in this charge distribution gives rise to hysteresis. So if we look at the uh, at the structure of a perovskite solar cells, so we have uh, these the selective transport layers. We have an active layer in between with grain boundaries. We have a whole transport layer here on top. Sometimes we have also mesoporous interfaces. These are all nanoscale structures. So these grains are typically 100 nanometer, sometimes a micron. The, the, the interface layers are typically just a couple of tens of nanometers. And so this is something where we actually, that's in the comfort zone of scanning probe microscopy. So that's ideal for AFM and KPFM. The problem is that those interfaces are all buried in interfaces. So if we do um, AFM experiments here on the top metal electrode, uh, we basically learn nothing compared to a device level um, experiment. The, Im the interesting part where hysteresis has to originate are act is actually this uh, zone here in between the selective layers and the active layer. So how can we make this accessible? Um, this, uh, we developed a careful method of breaking the device and polishing the cross section. Yes, yes. is there a question? <laughs> okay, I will just go on. So um, we, we use FIP polishing to get a smooth cross section to avoid topography crosstalk as much as possible. And um, uh, also using a thick platinum protection layer and very th slow milling uh, to avoid any contamination of the active layer with, with gallium ions. And then we use this smooth uh, cross-section to do Kelvin probe force microscopy on top. And uh, this is again um, an awesome paper by Ilka that you definitely need to check out. Then we can uh, map the potential distribution under different operating conditions, which is quite exciting. So we can look at the dark potential. We can look at short circuit conditions at open circuit conditions. So uh, meaning that we either have uh, the two electrodes uh, connected or one electrode disconnected. And here we see that, for example, the this charging in the perovskite layer is independent of whether we have the electrode connected or not, which we could learn an awful lot about um, how this solar cell is working. Um, and But here I want to point out one frequently asked question when I show this, um, this results is if a, a CPD profile is like an energy band diagram. So uh, usually what you see published with the solar cell papers is a band diagram that looks like this. So you have one common vacuum level and then you have your different, um, then you have your different materials with uh, valence band uh, and conduction band and band gap in between. Uh, but this is not how it looks like. So those, those materials, they all have Fermi levels. And as soon as they are in contact, the energy diagram will look like this. And especially here for the perovskite, where this actually this band is located strongly depends on the doping of the material. So if you have an N-type material, the Fermi level will be closer to the conduction band. If you have a P-type material, the Fermi level will be closer to the valence band. And so what will happen is that we have these shifts in the vacuum level that you also saw in the Kelvin probe energy band diagram earlier. Uh, so. Now the question is this vacuum level profile, the, uh, the contact potential difference signal that we see in Kelvin probe. And the answer is confusingly no, because an energy band diagram is the electrostatic energy of an electron and an electron has a negative charge. So the local contact potential difference is actually the flipped vacuum level profile through a device. And this is something important that you need to know when you interpret these uh, Kevin probe um, measurements on, uh, on cross sections. So here the definition of the electron charge as the negative charge is uh, causing lots of confusion. But once you wrap your head around it, it's actually quite clear. So what you need to remember is Kevin probe measures voltage and not electron energy. Okay, but now we want, we, I was talking about uh, hysteresis and slow processes happening on timescales to milliseconds to seconds. So to record such an image that takes, if you scan really fast, um, compromising the image quality, this will take 10 seconds. 
but if you want to have a proper image, you will need to sc scan at least like 10, 15 minutes. Of course, we are just interested in the profile of the potential. So we just could look at one scan line, but still that will take one, uh, 0.2 to one second. And it has a important disadvantage you're not first of all you're not completely decoupling the dynamic effects from the um uh from the scanning motion uh, you lose the 2d information and most importantly you waste lots of bandwidth of your kpfm system so with standard systems nothing fancy you can easily reach 10 kilohertz or 100 microsecond time resolution with your kevin probe si system so that's all wasted when you do scanning. So what we can do ex instead is just uh, to... Stefan? Yes. Sorry. Could you please try to, to wrap up? Because yes. We are getting um, closer to the end. If yes. you want to have some question. Okay. Um, yeah, this is, this is actually quite quick because so the idea you just saw the animation is to turn this uh, around, to position the tip at a certain position, to look at the dynamics uh, to, to record the dynamics on one with a fixed tip position, then move on to the next point. And then we have a data set that uh, contains the dynamics, the entire dynamics of this, uh, the, the system. And then we can reconstruct movies of the uh, potential difference. So here we used a uh, collaboration with EPFL. Uh, we had a device which decent, with decent efficiency and uh, some pronounced hysteresis. And we basically hacked the force mapping system on, a, on our Asylum MFP 3D. And that allows you to do surface drill. So you approach the tip, you leave it at the surface for a certain time and then um, do, can do experiments. So in this case, we just applied a voltage. And we, because of time reasons, I will just look at the position. So we have now the, the, the cell was pulled for half a second at minus 0.5 volt applied to the FTO electrode. And then we re go back to zero volt and the potential distribution here between the uh, spiral and the tin dioxide FTO electrode. So perovskite layers here in the middle then looks like this. So this is a movie with 500 microsecond resolution. You see that there is a strong reverse electric field forming in the cell. And this the interesting thing is that this field is perfectly linear so there's no space charges here and that we have a strongly localized charging here at the interface and that was basically the uh, the main take-home message from that work uh, that uh, we have a stabilization that we have a stabilization of the charge here at the interfaces and thereby we could explain the hysteresis in the device and that's all what that I wanted to show you today. I'm um, curious to hear your questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Stefan. Yes, indeed, um, it was a great introduction as well. I like the pedagogy, ped pedagogical approach that you had. Um, and of course, this is taking some time. Um, but then we will have actually not too much time for question. But um, so let me ask you one compare with uh, respect to the first uh, part, because um, you addressed a, a resolution uh, of uh, quantitative CPD measurement, but what yep. about um, the spatial resolution, let's say between heterodyne and air modes? From Pablo? Yeah. So uh, here again, the um, uh, I hate it to go through all the slides again, but uh, the important part is this capacity gradient. And uh, so in this simple model of the um, of this plate capacitor, uh, the the capacity the in the AM mode where we use just the capacity gradient, this is basically um, uh, telling me where the signal comes from. There is still strong contributions from the tip cone and from the cantilever itself, just because the area is so large. And if we take uh, 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 the one further derivative. So the second derivative, which is used in uh, in the FM modes, we will have a much stronger signal from the tip apex as compared to the tip cone and the cantilever. And that leads to a higher spatial resolution as well. So usually you will get uh, something like 10 nanometer resolution with your standard system with, um, with, uh, with FM. 
whereas I whereas I would say it's 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 50 to 100 nanometer deep, also deep, strongly depending on the lift height in your AM experiments. So it's good cool. it's good for several uh, things. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. I'm afraid we have to move on, uh, sure. but there will be time for question. Also, uh, I mean, you will be available in the coffee break in the afternoon, right? And um, so we yeah, have unfortunately, the... I have to do ah. teaching at four, which I didn't have um, on ah. the on the radar when uh, when looking at the schedule. Um, but yeah, I'm available for questions anytime. You can also contact me by email or, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stefan. Mm -hmm.